Good morning and welcome back to the practice stream. Um, I'm going to do some different things today because I mentioned this last time, but I have uh, a list of things that I haven't been doing enough of and I want to do them. So we're going to warm up a little bit uh, uh, just with some of these new things. I can even read it to you a bit if you'd like. Um, uh, so you can make this list on your own if you are uh, keeping a good practice journal or even if you're not and you just want to improve your practice. Uh, so I, I have a list of things to add to my routine, uh, things that I maybe want to do not every day but more often. Uh, some of them I want to do maybe every day, uh, like scales, right? I, I have been neglecting my scales, so I just wrote it down. Uh, and this, this, by the way, was generated by looking back through my trumpet journal uh, again, I'm not going to do a lot of journaling today um, because I don't think that it's very interesting for you, the viewer, but uh, I do journal every day, and that the result of that is that I can look back through and say, uh, hey, you know, what, what actually was working uh, a month ago or two months ago or eight months ago, right? What was I doing, and, and can, I rem can I recall, or sometimes I don't have to, right? I wrote it down. How did it work? What did it feel like, right? So a good journal can really tell you a lot of information. So I went back through the last six months of journals about two weeks ago, and I made this list. So that's where this comes from. Uh, so I want, I'll tell you what I want to add. I want to add scales. Uh, I, I rarely finish my practice template, which tells you to do transposition, excerpts, uh, all these different things. I, I so, suppose if I wrote down what I did in lessons with students, then I might get closer. And, uh, but one of the big ones is record myself and then watch that recording and then practice based on what I observed and then, and then record it again and see if I can do any better. I don't typically complete that process because it takes a long time, right? You have to sit and watch, but it doesn't really need to. It just feels like it will, right? Uh, so I, I, I count these, these recordings uh, as recording myself. So I do it at least once a week, right? But I don't. Uh, and I do always watch the entire video right after it posts. I, I want to make sure that it, well, first of all, that it, you know, there, are, there is sound in it, right? I, just in case something goes wrong with my system. Uh, I also want to make sure that I didn't say anything stupid. And, uh, but mostly I go back and listen to the trumpet playing and make sure that that is the kind of thing that I want to put out there. It doesn't have to be good. It just has to be really honest, right? And so uh, anyway, that's my goal. So I do it once a week, but I really should do it every day. At, and I put it at the end of the template, and that's generally why I don't get to it. So I could maybe move that. Anyway, uh, the three-note samba, I will show you what that is. Uh, this is a trick that I sort of invented to, to get students and also myself to play more by ear. So um, let's do that. And I also, uh, the next one is alto and bass trumpet. Okay, so I want to play some alto and bass trumpet right now. Uh, I'm going to do it. We're going to get, I have to get my bass trumpet out. Hold on. I forgot to get it out before, but this is a really lovely Selmer, uh, sort of a faux gold plate. Uh, you can see it sort of, it looks gold plate. It might actually be real gold plating. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to test that, but it's extremely, the bell is extremely thin. Uh, I don't think that it could be, I think it's a gold, a gold colored lacquer. Uh, that makes more sense. And, oh, it needs, I haven't been playing it. See, I told you. So we might have to put a little uh, valve oil in this. But, uh, I, so let's play a little alto and bass. And I'll do three-note samba, I call it, right? So uh, you, you probably already know the one-note samba and um, the... Uh, the two note samba, there is, you know, that's not a real thing, but three notes, it could be two notes, it could be three notes, it could be four notes, but I just wrote this down because it's a new thing that I came up with. So we'll do it a little bit on the bass trumpet. This is bass in C. Like I said, this is an old Selmer. Um, and I'm very bad at it, so I don't expect this to go super well, but, um, but what am I trying to learn from it? Well, uh, first of all, the low, low trumpet playing is difficult for me, and I'm playing on a bass trumpet mouthpiece. This is the uh, the, the, the one that uh, Park makes that is, um, uh, uh, well, it's just a, it's one shape of a bass trumpet mouthpiece, right? Sort of a C cup shape. If you play a one and a half C, this is a giant one and a half C. So, let's see, I'll get the bell in. 
it, I like this trumpet too because it makes me look like I'm a, I'm a tiny person, right? Like it's, it sort of looks like a normal trumpet, uh, maybe a flugelhorn-ish, right? But like, see, I just look, I just look miniature, which is great. Um, so anyway. So I'm just going to play bass trumpet for a little bit, right? Just get used to this horn. What am I trying to get out of it? I want, I want a small aperture that uh, I can open up the tone on, right? And still be able to play at least as much of the range of the bass trumpet as, uh, as I can. And um, because it's extra super long, right, I can maybe practice some things that I couldn't practice on shorter horns, like, oh, I don't know, uh, uh, lip slurs in the high register, right, they're, when they're closer together, well, now they're not in the high register, but they're still close together, right? So there are some things, and then of course you can play actual notes that are much, much lower, like I don't have to play pedal C, it's just C. So anyway, that's what I'm trying, trying to get instant response and controlled aperture from this. takes a lot of air too, um, just because I don't really know how to play it efficiently, right? So that's another thing we can work on. I, I preach this reflection concept, uh, this, this forward sound concept. Can I do that on this horn? I don't know. Let's try. I guess we can, sort of, right? Now, is that going to be good for my overall playing today? I don't know, but it sure is fun, right? So, uh, okay, I didn't do any three-note three, three note samba. Uh, let me switch to alto, and I'll just do that. Now that, we're, now that we're suitably warmed up into the big trumpets, you can hear me closing this case over here. It's not really meant. It's a Bach bass trumpet case that just happens to fit that horn almost perfectly uh, that my dad got for me, so thanks, Dad. Um, now, let's see. This is the... This is my Bach Alto. Uh, this is a uh, Elkhart. We have a Mount Vernon actually at my, in my dad's collection that is absolutely mu uh, just museum quality pristine. Uh, nothing been done to it. Uh, the, it has that beautiful French bead rolled thickness bell, I believe. And um, it's just a great Mount Vernon instrument. Uh, this has been modified so it has a trumpet receiver and uh, I can do a little pitch finder on this part. This, this is usually just a tube. It's just fixed there uh, with, a tuning, with a water key on it, yes, but, uh, but you can't move it. So I had that cut and fixed uh, in that way. And um, what else has been done to this? Uh, I guess maybe that's it. Hmm. If I think of anything else, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you as I play. But okay, so let's do three notes samba. What is this uh, exercise? Well, it's basically, the idea of it anyway, is that uh, it's really hard for people to just play by ear. They, they kind of resist it because we're so used to reading notes on the page, right? So uh, the three note samba is pick any three notes you want. And uh, it's easy if they're close together, like a scale or, um, or, you know, chromatic, like three chromatic notes 
or uh, maybe they're like F, G, and A, like an F, F major scale, or maybe it's like uh, G and C and B natural, right? So that there's some sort of like fourth relation that sounds like a 5-1 when you play it, if you want that. And then you can still sort of do like three of the five, right? And, and you can also do just uh, one and seven scale degrees, right? So you can pick any three notes you want. Um, in fact, that might be fun to do. Let's, let's try that out. Oh, and I should change my, I have my chat up. So if anybody has questions or wants to talk, uh, feel free. I'm, I'm actively monitoring uh, the chat. So I'm trying to get my OBS out of the way so I can see the whole chat. Uh, anyway, all right, so let's try that. So let's establish our notes, make sure we can do that on this trumpet. So we can play a little melody like that. But basically, you're just going to use repetition and rhythm, right? These are musical elements that we should really be better at anyway. And uh, you're going to compose a little piece that's just only these three notes. And you can't play any other notes. And uh, for me, the goal uh, is to sell it musically. Uh, in other words, I, I want arrivals. I want surprise, right? Uh, I want, and I also want to try to establish each of the three different tones as the tonic, so to speak. The, 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 I want each one to feel at some point in the piece that it is, the, it is coming home. To, so the G, uh, I, I'll, I'll do something, and it takes, it takes some experience, right, to figure out how you might do that, but the easiest way is just to play it a lot, right? Just play, if you want G to sound like home bass, just play G for like a minute, and it'll sound like the only thing, right? As long as you don't then ruin it and play C right away after or whatever, right? So, um, so I'll, I'm not going to do minutes and minutes, but I actually it's a good way to just say like, okay, I want good production, and I'm gonna I'm gonna play with rhythmic elements, and uh, I'm only allowed to play these three notes, and uh, I want to I want to make a piece that sells sells it musically and also tries to establish different home. And I guess maybe that's un, that's inconsequential, right? It's just a thing that I like to do is okay i'm going to start with uh well in this case we'll we'll talk we'll talk it through and then i'll see if i can sell it to you right so uh, i'm going to i'm going to start with c as my home note and I, I can establish that through g to c right that 5 1 sound that we're all familiar with from most tonal music uh and then i've got the b in there and so uh i'll do the c first and then the B next, and then I'll do the G last as the home home base note, right? The, to, the 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 tonal center is the best way to put that, I think. And then I'll come back to C at the end for a nice sort of form, right? Um, all right, so let's try it out. I, I'm gonna actually before I do that, I only need the second valve to work well, and it's not working well, so I'm gonna give it a little oil. Sorry about that. I'm just thinking, oh, I don't really want to play a piece where one of the one of the three notes I can play is uh, is a sticky valve. Okay, I have to check on these old Bach horns. Uh, the numbers don't always go towards the front like they should. Um, and in this case, let's see if this one. Do I don't think it does. But you just want to check them. Yeah, this one goes backwards. This second valve. Well, does it? Yeah. See, you just have to check to see before you play anything. All right, here we go. So. Bye. 
That's some, something interesting, right? Kind of a, a unique piece that we're just writing on the fly. Uh, we only have three notes, so it's, it's really tempting, right, to play, oh man, I could just play a D and then I'd really have like a G major chord, or oh man, if I could just, if I could just play like uh, a, a, an A sharp, then I would have this B really nailed down. Um, or just anything else, right? You get almost frustrated by the, the constraints, but that constraint is really what makes it uh, artistic in, in a way, right? If you don't have any constraints, then you're not really doing any, uh, you're just doing whatever you want. And there's nothing wrong with that, but uh, the constraints make it interesting. They, they make it a puzzle to solve, right? And that I think is really fascinating. Um, but it, 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 it's relevant is more important because the puzzle that we normally solve is a set of notes on a page that we have to be able to play in order, in, in time, in rhythm usually, right? So I, I generally am restricted when I play music, right? By the notes that are on the page. I have to play these notes. I can't just play whatever I want. Uh, try as some people might to, to sort of, you know, move the needle of interpretation. Uh, you know, the, there's, there's some things that just are not... <laughs> You're not playing the piece that, that you're, you say you're playing if you change too much, right? So there, and I tend to be very conservative about that. If the composer can write it, then I want to, I, I, uh, and, and they didn't, then I don't want to do it. If the composer uh, forgot something, well then may, maybe, but, um, but how do you know that, right? If, so I try to just play what's on the page as precisely as possible, which when we're doing Shazam later in this, uh, uh, this uh, I, was gonna, I was just almost to say, about to say podcast. I guess it's a video podcast in, in a certain way. But uh, in this live stream, uh, we'll do some Shazam and we'll see that, right? So my third valve is bad now too. But that's okay. We don't need this horn anymore. So that's, that's my, that's my uh, Elkhart uh, F alto. And um, yeah, I feel a little fatigued uh, from oh, you know, playing loud on a low, on a bass trumpet mouthpiece and a low trumpet. But that's why I need to do more alto and bass trumpet, right, from my list. So, okay, let's finish the, the list. Loud playing is next on the list. Check, did it. Color change, well, we did a little bit of that, and uh, we might need to play with that some in Shazam, but uh, it's a little bit tedious, and I've covered it before. Uh, so, uh, we, well, we might do a little just to get back into a normal trumpet mouthpiece, right? Uh, drones, well, we're not gonna do drones today, uh, but I've been doing them when I do my mouthpiece buzzing in the morning to make sure that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm referencing a relevant pitch center, right? I don't want to just be all over the place. Um, swell tones. Swell tones is a really interesting one. Um, on the, I can show you that a little bit too. Uh, a B flat trumpet. Yes, please. And a regular mouthpiece. Okay, good. We're, we're good to go. So a swell tone. Um, I, so I've been working on trying to get my aperture smaller, right? But with the same big sound that I want and the same production method, that forward production, right? So I, essentially a smaller aperture is gonna be more efficient. It doesn't have to be uh, tighter or, or softer or duller in sound uh, as long as it's pliable, right? Um, I, I, it, I can blow it open, but then it also stays active when I, when I come down on the, on the volume, right? So, a swell tone starts off with that small aperture, then sees if it checks to see if I can grow that into a big, louder, brighter sound. And then I have to practice that taper. I've been doing this swell tones on, uh, um, on my mouthpiece buzzing in the morning because it forces me to taper those notes. Uh, I did it yesterday at school and I just happened to have like a free hour and I said, oh, good thing I brought my extra, all my extra mouthpieces, uh, my, the ones that I showed last video. And so I did these little, these tapers with the piano, right? I tried to just match the piano's volume and boy, was it tough, but I learned a lot and I, I learned how far I have to go on those things, right? So, so swell tones is a good way to do it. I'll just do, I don't know, a couple here. So, See, it's, <laughs> I'm still a little swollen from what I just played, but. It's really hard to roll off into silence 
without pitch skew. And this has always been a problem of mine since before I remembered uh, my, when I was going out for grad school auditions, my teacher at the time said, you know, one of the biggest problems you have is pitch skew on your note releases. And so I'm gonna help you with that by giving you this reverb module uh, to practice with. And so you're gonna put this microphone on your trumpet, you're gonna use this amplifier, and you're gonna just practice with the tuner right in front of you. And you're gonna try to keep that pitch down. It, 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 my mind scoops up, right? I'll, I'll, do, I'll do it on purpose. All right. And in some ways, that's, that's a good start to a good taper, right? You're, you're releasing it off into the, uh, uh, into the air, but obviously we don't want it to keep responding that long, so I have to do a little more. That's a good one. And uh, you know, I'm using uh, uh, one of my current and, and former students' previous teacher, uh, it's Tim Hudson, and he does, they all do what's called the Tim step. When you want sort of a deliberate timing uh, to, to, for something to happen, you just put that, that foot down, right? And I use that on these. It's really critical for me. I, I need some event to be the timing that the note stops for me. So I'll, and I, I do it completely by accident. I just, I know what to call it now, right? So... you'll hear that I have shoes on today, so you'll hear that on the floor. But anyway, so those are swell tones. Uh, and then cut out placement exercises. I don't have my, oh, I do have my cut. I probably have it in there. Um, these are basically for sort of strength building uh, and also the same aperture kind of work. And we did, we did cut out last time, so I don't think you need to see me do a lot of it, but just working through my list here uh, in this first you know, half hour. And then we'll get to the Shazam stuff. I should probably go back on YouTube and, you know, mention when the real practice begins. But this is all really relevant, right? And I, I as, a, as a trying to be a good steward of good practice habits, I am duty bound to show you what I really do. Uh, it, I mean, you, know, you don't have to like what the result is, right? You might hate my trumpet playing. Uh, and that's, you know, that's like your opinion, man. Uh, but, but that's fine. I, I, I don't doesn't bother me, uh, but I should show, if some, in case somebody wanted to know what I did, I should show them, right? And that's, that's part of the honesty of this, this live stream uh, and the, that I leave all the videos up. There was one a couple of weeks ago where I just, I just couldn't think straight, you know? I must not have slept well or something, and I thought about taking it down, but I decided later that, no, this is, I did some good stuff on there, and it's okay to have a bad day for one reason or, not, uh, or another, um, I, but what that video actually shows in a way it shows, well, it shows me being sort of dumb, right? It, okay. Yeah, fine. But it also shows me getting something done on the trumpet, even though I can't really get my brain fully activated. Right. And I think that that is worth, uh, worth somebody seeing. Maybe that somebody stumbles across that video one day and says, oh, right, this guy is an idiot, but he's still getting something done. I'm much smarter than he is, but I never get anything done in the practice room, right? Maybe, maybe there's something wrong with the way I practice. Or, or maybe they say, oh, you know what? Uh, I feel like that sometimes, and I, I always just give up. But this guy got some stuff done anyway, and I guess I could just stay in the practice room another half hour and see what I can get done just so I get somewhere today, right? So anyway, uh, that's, that's what we're trying to do. So um, the cutout placement exercise is kind of a way to just place notes. So in this case, uh, I, I want it to be specific notes. And we can start with uh, the beginning of Shazam, which is a G on top of the staff, right? So, oh, I believe is the note, but we'll see. Right, I was right. I'm almost, it's like a, if I play trumpet for more than a half hour, then uh, suddenly I have like trumpet perfect pitch a little bit, right? Okay, so my cutout, it works in the trumpet, right? Because 
it ha it's built out of a real real trumpet mouthpiece. Um, so can I can I just poo attack this and then I have to articulate on it a little bit? And what I'm learning is first of all how to place this note. I'm also building strength and I'm also building strength of habit with my aperture. If my aperture is too spread and wide and and pressed, then I'm going to get an airy sound, and which I, I can do that for you. Oh, sorry. Right? You can hear all this air going by. I want, I want to minimize that. Lip trills right there don't really don't really do anything right because um, there's no slots to do the trills but so that, that was just a little bit of what you can do with it right um, and since the the theme of this is TV practice do's and don'ts I'll start with a don't or a do on this do do some cutout work on the real notes right you can absolutely you can absolutely do cutout buzzing on every note that you can play on the trumpet as long as you have the the same sort of pressure um, vector. Now it's not, it's maybe not as easy or maybe for some people it's easier than it is on the trumpet, right? Which reveals some things about your practice and your, uh, or sorry, your, your production that you uh, might really get a lot out of. Uh, so I, I highly recommend, I used to hate stuff like this. Anything that wasn't trumpet playing, I was like, no, that's, who cares about that, right? But they're tools to reveal things that we might want to work on. And that's, uh, those tools are extremely valuable. You know, uh, what, I mean, that's why you go to the doctor, you go to the doctor and they say, Hey, you're not, uh, eating enough iron. And so you're going to be anemic if you're not careful and you go, Oh, geez, I, I didn't even feel different. You know, I just, I didn't know that. And they go, yeah, you better start eating some iron and you go, okay, right. I guess I'll get some black beans this week. Right. I mean, and then you, you avoid a big problem later down the road. So, uh, we need these diagnostic tools, right? And the cutout is a great one, uh, but not only is it great, it also is the solution to some issues as well, right? It's the way you work on other things. So while it might reveal things to you, it also might help you uh, work on things that you didn't even know you needed to work on. Or uh, at some point more deliberately that, oh, you know what? If I do more cutout, it will help me work on this. In this case, my, my placement accuracy, I don't need to place a lot of notes, but I do need to, well, I want the first note of the piece to go great, right? And there might be other places in this that I need to place things. Um, in fact, we can see if that's the case. Well, why don't we practice through it and then we'll see where we get, right? There are some, stu the, some, some nasty high notes that are just like, you just have to sort of pick out of nowhere. Um, and there's also some last nasty low notes. Let's see if I can find any. Uh, there's this high B flat that's really nasty. Let's see if we can learn to pick that off. Uh, this one I'll have to get in my ear. I don't have that good relative pitch. Da, da, da. Ah, I double guessed it. Da. So we need the high B flat of that. I'm not getting it very well. It's also kind of wobbly. Um, this is this might be practice that I do actually after some normal, a lot more normal trumpet playing, um, so that I can I can feel like how how I I want it to be closer to the 
actual trumpet playing. I don't, in other words, I don't want to start with the cutout all the time and then play the trumpet that way. I want to try it on the trumpet and then see how the cutout might help me do that better so that it's based on the trumpet playing instead of the cutout. So anyway, that's, that's the kind of thing. If I, if I can, you know, it's, not, it's sort of loud, right? Um, so I'm not going to beat my head against the wall on that. And I'm also not going to just immediately go do it on trumpet. I'm going to work through the piece like normal. And then I'll discover some things that I, I want the cutout to help me with, and then I can do those. All right, so let's get down to business, uh, or, or beesness, as it may, uh, depending on who you are and where you're from. Um, so TV practice, what is it? And what should you do and what shouldn't you do? Uh, oh, I was just about to give you a warning about cutout. Don't do too much cutout because of what I just said, right? It'll make you feel like that's how trumpet works. It's not. It's a diagnostic tool and a, and a tool to help you work on your muscle strength and placement, but uh, it doesn't, it's not the whole way that everything works. So a couple of minutes at a time, just like what I just did, right? I did about a minute the first time. I, I did maybe uh, 30 seconds just now. I don't want to do a ton. Uh, two, up to two minutes is a good sort of time frame for stuff like that. Anything that's not trumpet playing that you're, you're worried you might build too much habit into, yeah, then you know, limit the time you do it at a time. For two minutes here, and then rest for a while, and then maybe play some regular trumpet again, and just be be deliberate about that. And if you're journaling well, you will make sure you look back in your journals. You will find these patterns. You'll say, yeah, you know, this part. But you have to you have to actually say like how your practice went. Otherwise, it's just what you did, and that doesn't really give you a sense of of the quality of it or or the success of it. So if you did you know, 18 minutes of uh, cutout buzzing, and then you went back and tried to play the piece and you felt really tired during that. If you didn't write down how tired you felt, then you will never know, right? Uh, I mean, you'll, you'll know right then. But w days later, you might do 16 minutes of cutout buzzing again because you, you keep trying the same thing and, and it, you know, it just hasn't worked yet. Well, okay, but if you write down everything about it, then at least after that second day, you'll go, maybe I shouldn't do this. I'm really tired when I do the piece. Maybe I should do less cutout and more trumpet or whatever, right? So, so just be careful, be cognizant of that. Um, okay, so um, I could go through the rest of my list uh, and, and just real quickly for you, uh, I wanna practice earlier in the day. Yeah, I've been doing that. Uh, pucker and window and M embouchure uh, is my embouchure posture. So I've been working on some new ideas about embouchure for me uh, that combine, I think that I finally have enough understanding about different methods to, to be able to unify some of the things that have been really disparate for me, like pucker and M embouchure always seem different. But what if they are both tools to get towards the same really great embouchure that's in between the boat? Like maybe you need both. And the, the window device, which I don't think I have around here, but uh, it's a little expensive, but it's a really good way to get your corners attached to your airflow and to expect a certain type of release of air. And uh, so I've been trying to keep to, to, to connect the window and pucker to an M embouchure, which has a smaller aperture, and uh, get that to work on the cutout and, uh, and then also on the trumpet. So anyway... Um, uh, I want to listen more. I haven't been listening to trumpet every single day, and that's not hard to do. I just got out of the practice of it. Uh, I need to rest longer. I'm doing that right now. I need to release my buzzing. We talked about that already. And my posture, my actual bodily posture needs to be better, and I just fixed it a little bit, right? Uh, I need to engage my back muscles a little more so that I'm, I'm set, set up a little straighter. Uh, and so then I got some corners here. Basically, blow through. Like, in other words, don't, don't let it be resisted, but make sure that airflow is correct. Embouchure posture, we just talked about that. And, um, and I just had a tip that I, didn't, I hadn't really addressed in a long time. My, I sa it says lower corners firmness equals good low response. I'm not even sure if I remember exactly what that means. I mean, it's pretty straightforward, but, uh, but maybe we'll use it, right? I've got lots of low notes in this piece. So, okay, now here we are at, uh, this is for, I guess, for me later, 36 and a half minutes, and we're finally going to do TV practice. So what is it? Uh, TV practice is a thing that I didn't invent, absolutely, um, but that I do use a lot. Lots of people have done this in the past. 
Uh, I learned it from my undergrad teacher uh, who just mentioned it. He didn't tell me to do it ever. He just mentioned that he does it. And I thought, oh, well, yeah, okay, cool. So what, uh, what is it? Well, you watch TV while you practice. Pretty straightforward, right? And you might think, oh, Gabriel, now you told me to focus. And, you, you know, my teacher uh, at home tells me not to turn the TV on and practice, right? Because I'll be distracted and I won't practice well. Yeah, absolutely. Those are all correct. Um, this is a specialized type of practice for when you've done all of that already, right? So uh, I, I do TV practice. I can, I can keep the TV on for certain types of things that are routine items like long tones. Long tones, uh, especially at the end of the day. I don't like to do it in the morning because I want to really make sure, uh, again, I want to focus, right? I want to think about uh, what my tone sounds like. I want to think about getting that reflection. I want to think about my turnaround. I want to think about the airflow. I want to think about exponential support, right? Those are all long tones things to think about. I don't want to take up brain space trying to keep track of a TV program. So it's not a good idea to do it when you're setting things up. But let's say you're working on your endurance and you want to do another set of long tones in the evening and you just need to play for a while and you've been playing you know, maybe two or three hours already you just want to do another I don't know five or ten minutes of long tones well that's a great time to turn the TV on because you've already established how you want to play your body's already used to it and you're you're really just you're not gonna accidentally you know drop off and not notice right it's you're not totally checked out of your trumpet playing but you just need you need to do five or ten more minutes of just long tones, just to establish a little bit stronger habits maybe after they've already been formed. So what do you do? Well, you turn on the TV and you just do your long tones, right? Uh, I can also do pretty good slow slurs this way because I can check on them as I'm going for the slur and then check out as I hold the note and then check back in as I slur back the other way or whatever. Um, I don't necessarily recommend it if you have, if you struggle at all with any of the, the, that stuff. The TV practice is not for what you don't know how to do yet, right? It's for what you do know how to do, but don't do um, automatic. Like, what you do know how to do, but you don't um, do every time. It's for consistency, essentially, right? So, um, so yeah. So things that you don't, so, so things that you can think about for a moment and then stop thinking about and still keep doing them, right? Uh, so it's great for technical practice and repetition, which is what I use it for. So uh, that's, the, that's the idea of TV practice. And um, it's essentially, here, here's, the, here's the setup. When you, we all know, uh, and we don't talk about this maybe, uh, certainly in my studio I don't talk about it enough, but we all know that once you get something the first time, you, that's not the end of the story, right? You don't just practice it until you get it once, although many people do, uh, but they're, they suffer from the, well, it was great in the practice room uh, syndrome, right? Where it's like, I don't understand, you know, it was really great yesterday. It's like, well, okay, right. Was that the first time it was great? And how many times after that was it great? Uh, if, if it was only one time that you've ever played it great, it, you're not going to get it the next time you play it probably, right? Uh, but people don't know that. So, so the, uh, the, you, you need to be able to get it every time. And so you do that by repetition, right? You make sure that you can get it every time by playing it a lot of times. And all of those times went well virtually, right? So I have, a, I have a thing on my wall in my studio that's like a bunch of squiggly lines next to each other. And then some of them are part of, like it'll be part of a line that's straight and a different part of the line that's straight. And, uh, and then like the whole line, but part of it's squiggly. And that's just, that's representative of, okay, the first trial doesn't work out. And the second trial doesn't work out. It's not a, it's not a straight line yet. Uh, and then like, okay, I'll break it down into parts. So I can get just this part and I can get just this part and I can get, both of them together? No, not quite. I got a little squiggle in there. So that's, it's just a visual representation of how practicing works, right? But then the lines are all straight after a while, and then you need to do like 20 of them. In fact, however many squiggles you had, you have to at least outnumber the squiggles. Otherwise, you've done more squiggling than straight lines, right? You've played it imperfectly more than you've played it perfectly, so you still have a, a better chance of it going wrong tomorrow than, than right. So you got to at least outweigh the squiggles, but then, then that's when, that, so that's what TV practice is good for. Once you've, once you've got the straight lines happening every time, now let me just do it on autopilot while I watch TV, right? Um, I'm not, I don't have a TV in this room. I'm just going to pretend to watch TV. I'll watch you um, so that you know I'm not really looking at my music. Uh, it's also a good way to memorize things, but I, it tends to go away too quickly for me. 
I, I still need to look at the music. I just remember it really quickly uh, when I when I do this kind of practice. But anyway, so then w once you have it like straight line, straight line, straight line, that's TV practice. And then how long, if you do it over and over and over again, you're practicing it right now, so it's fresh, right? How long can you go before you forget how to do it again, right? And TV practice is really great for that because you have something to do while you wait, right? You're not just standing there and going one, two, three, You know, yeah, that's not, that's not what you're you're not doing that. I can't believe I got both of those, by the way. I, I thought for sure one of them would be. But anyway, lucky me. Right. So uh, you're not just count, like slightly longer, slightly longer. You just watch TV for a while and set up a timer. Right. And so, OK, so that's how it works. That's what it is. Uh, it's for repetition. And then it's for uh, walking out the, the, the perfect version to longer, so that you become the Iceman on that specific subject, whatever it is. If it's an excerpt, if it's a, a lick in a piece that you've been struggling with, that you can just do it at a cold, at just totally cold, right? And that's not necessary for everything. For instance, the beginning of this piece, I'd like to be able to do cold, but three lines in, I'm never going to do that cold. So I don't need to do that with that. Uh, if it's a really nasty lick, though, I like to still walk it out because then I can practice the concentration that I need to activate to get it. And, and that, at that point, you, you do concentrate when you play the lick and you ignore the TV, but then you have something to do in between where uh, you're essentially not spending a lot of concentration energy, but you are doing something. Uh, and so it's a distraction, right? You're not, you're, you're not like keeping that stuff fresh in your mind. You're, you're letting it go, and then you're practicing putting it back, right? That's, that's really the key to being really consistent is learning what it is you have to put in place so that you're you're ready to go right when you need to be uh this is not unlike the, the david allen getting things done method you need you need to see what you need to know exactly when you need to know it and not any other time and you need to trust that system so that's what writing in your music is for right uh here's what i need to think about but it's really hard to do like what you know uh what, what am i supposed to think about how it would take me a paragraph to write what i need to think about to go um Yeah, I got to practice this one, but it's, you know, right. I, I'm not ready to do it yet, but to do that perfectly when I get there, I don't know what word I would write, like good, yeah, right? So, so it, it's not a thing that you can write in your music and therefore it needs to be programmed in so that that lick is just a push button lick. Um, and so, okay, so that's what it is. And that's kind of how it works. Now, how do you do it? Well, uh, you have to sort of be careful. It's very easy to just go and go and go and go and not um, and, and not have any discipline about like you, you can just do this for hours and hours and uh, and not notice that you've you've been actually hurting yourself this whole time. Right. So so be deliberate about the time frame that you're going to do it for. And remember that you need concentration to do it, at least in some parts. And um, and actually you need concentration a little bit the whole time because your ultimate goal is to be able to play whatever lick it is that you're practicing on autopilot while you keep track of the television program. So you're splitting your attention a little bit. And uh, that is representative of maybe kind of how it feels on stage when you're like, you get that fleeting thought of like, oh my gosh, my girlfriend's in the audience. What if she breaks up with me after I miss this note? I mean, that's a crazy thought, but we all have stuff like that when we're on stage. Why? Like, we're just, you know, we're all anxious people. I, I don't know. Um, I need to go to therapy more. Uh, but if I have that thought, sometimes it means I miss the note, right? But not if I've practiced this way, not if it's already, it, I already know it's going to be there. And then I don't have those thoughts as much because I know everything's going to go well and I've practiced it, right? So, okay, let's get into it. Um, I do like to set a timer, but, uh, you can set it either count up or count down. If you do count up, which is what I'm going to do then you need to be cognizant of however long you feel good about something, uh, that's fine. You can you try to complete this this one lick or something like that, whatever your scope is. Um, and I'll show you how to do that. Uh, but be cognizant of it. Look at your timer a lot. Keep it in, in, in eyesight because if you 
if you practice for like 35 minutes this way, you've done too much, right? You want to keep it within a 20 minute sort of area um, and then at least stop after 20 minutes. I mean, the 20 minutes is a long time to play trumpet without stopping. So, uh, I mean, 10 minutes is a really long time, right? What piece do you play for 10 minutes without stopping? I don't know of one. Uh, that's not true. I do. But if unless you're playing Barrio Sequenza uh, and, and st or stuff like that, Uber Lippentanza, um, all these unaccompanied pieces, Shazam is in there, but Shazam is only six and a half minutes or so. So uh, we'll call it seven. So if I'm doing something for longer than seven minutes, that's, that's too long for me, for right now. Uh, I don't need to go beyond that, and doing so might hurt me, right? So, um, so just keep an eye on it. And then what you're going to do is you're going to find out what time that was, and you're going to rest at least that long, if not longer, right? So uh, and the TV gives you something to do during that time, right? So I'm going to go, I'm just going to go for smaller amounts of time. Um, and, and you can use the countdown timer for this. Uh, let's say you want to practice in three minute chunks. You're going to rest for three minutes. You're going to play for three minutes. That's a good amount of time. You can get something done in that amount of time. Uh, but then you're, you're going to at least rest. And you can still work if you want to keep concentrating through and like work on the fingerings and stuff. You can do that. You just can't physically play longer and longer and longer. Um, so, and it, it, it defeats the purpose a little bit of having the TV. If you have to look at the music and do the fingerings, you, then the TV is, is, is just a distraction. So most of this is really playing practice, okay? So uh, we're just gonna do count up for now and see how long we go. And then we might switch over to a count down based on whatever interval seems to be working for us. Okay, so here we go. Um, and I'm just gonna, play, I'm gonna start with that lick right there. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm gonna start a couple before that. So uh, first I need to learn the lick, right? I, I'm, normal practice habits, right? Sl going slow, doing, in, doing it in chunks, uh, making sure that my production, my, that everything is good about it. I'm not just gonna start banging my head against the wall, you know, you know, that's not, that's not productive practice. And in fact, it's counterproductive because now I'm learning that I'm gonna play this bad uh, physically, but I feel really confident that that's like built in. So I don't want to build that in. I want to build in the best playing. So, so here is. I'm gonna check my. I think I got it actually a pretty good place today. You can see as I look up into the camera off the page, now I'm just I'm just running the program. I'm not thinking about fingerings. I'm not even really thinking about you know the the sound anymore. I'm just repeating the sounds that I I'm just sort of matching it up. Is this the same as last time, right? And if there was a TV program on, of course you use the subtitles. Um, you you're just gonna you're, you're gonna try like you're you're turning off the part of your brain that needs to think about what you're playing and you're turning on the part that's like, oh, well, what's, what's she gonna do about that? I don't know. I thought they were friends, you know? You're like, you're engaged in the plot at hand, right? Um, so that's, that's how you do it. Now, you might've noticed in one spot, my fingers sort of slipped a little bit. I had a bunch of good ones in a row and then I got one that was like, my finger was slow. Yeah, if you do the same technical lick over and over and over again, you're basically building in like a, a, a very localized um, uh, repetitive stress syndrome, right? That you're, you're not gonna necessarily get like tendonitis. I mean, if you do this every day, maybe, but uh, you're not gonna necessarily get tendonitis or any long-term effects, but you are just gonna notice like some sluggishness in maybe your third finger. In this case, it was my second finger, um, which makes sense, right? It, my second finger didn't wanna come up because it doesn't for half the lick, but it has to come up on the, on the repetition of the lick. And I didn't want to do that, so I got some weird results. Um, yeah, okay, fine. 
Uh, maybe it was my first finger coming down too slow on the D flat one time. I think it's, that's what it felt like. Um, you're, you're causing that problem by doing this type of practice. So when you feel that happen, especially if it happens a couple times in a row, it's time to stop. So that was three minutes with a lot of the talking. Let's call it two minutes because I, I did talk a lot. I forgot to stop it. So we'll call that two minutes. And uh, I feel like that lick is pretty well done. So I could do two things now. I could go, I could sit down and watch TV for two minutes and then come back to this lick and see if it's where I left it. That's a good idea, uh, especially if I need to ice it out of nowhere. I don't on this, in this case. Or I can come back and try to build it into the overall piece in context. That's not TV practice. That's just normal practice. I need to concentrate for that, right? Uh, unless, I'm, unless I'm memorizing the piece, in which case I better have all of that memorized really well, right? Um, and then I guess you could still pay attention to the TV, but I find that very difficult to do. I need to be, I need to be thinking about the music I'm making, right? So this is just rote practice. This is just to, to, to make these absolute automatic pilot. We used to call these push button licks, right? Where it's like, it's as if your trumpet had a, a, a row of buttons all along it here, right? And you just went, you went, oh, okay, this button now. And then this lick over here. Right? <laughs> In other words, you're not you're not you're not reading the music. You're not thinking through it. You're just you've practiced it so much that you just go, yep, this next, this next, this next. And you can you can have a certain number of those where you've figured out how to do it. And you've done it so many times that you can just turn on that switch and and do the thing. Uh, you can't have a whole piece uh, push button that way. Uh, it, it's too many buttons, and so then all of the buttons are weaker. So the the more you do this, the uh, the weaker each. Uh, the, 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 you have to average this type of thing, uh, this type of memory, physical memory, right, over the number of things that you're trying to keep up this way. You can great, you can have a great number of them. And you can practice them very deeply. And you can do like maybe all of Shazam, for instance, uh, as push button licks. But, um, and, and in many ways, that's what really great performers do. They play the same pieces a lot, right? It's not because they're lazy. It's because they're finally really getting it on autopilot all the way through. So they can really do some crazy musical things that, uh, or, or maybe some, some really difficult techniques, right? Hoken Hardenberger is amazing at this, where like, I don't, I used to think like, I don't know how you do, like, I'm listening to the record, but I don't know how he does this. Like, this is really difficult physically to do. And he's just doing it the whole pe this whole, like, you know, whatever it is. Uh, At the Beach is full of this stuff, right? That album. Well, yeah. And uh, it's because he actually practiced it a lot, right? And, and worked really hard to get there. And then once, once it was all on, like, the fingerings and the rhythms and the, the sounds were all on autopilot, he could think about his tongue position a little more, maybe. Or, and I don't know that that's how he did it, but... For me to deconstruct, if I were to do it, it is intel. It is possible to do. I mean, obviously, because he did it. Um, and and but th what I mean is, th it's a, through a great amount of repetition that things get to that level. Uh, it's not because you're, you you can start as the world's greatest trumpet player, but you still got to learn this piece and you still got to work your way around it, right? So that's really what we're doing. All right, that was three minutes that time, so that was a good amount of rest. And I won't bore you guys with doing this uh, for another hour or something, right? I'll do it as much as seems like it's still working. If, again, if you want to ask, ask questions, I saw, by the way, uh, an, uh, an unknown person. It's not telling me what uh, that you're on. It just says you're on YouTube, I guess. Um, it says awesome. And that was when we were doing the alto trumpet. I'm sorry I didn't recognize you back then. But thank you for that uh, encouragement. I, uh, I was hoping that it would pop up with a name, and that's why I sort of ignored it. But yeah, please ask questions about this technique, uh, this, this practice uh, sort of technique. It, it's, it's one that I used to use more consistently, and, uh, and guess what? I was a more consistent trumpet player, so I'm, I'm back to using it. Okay, let's get to the nitty-gritty of it. Uh, we've got one lick in between that one and the one that I folded on at the beginning. So, uh, I don't think I need to practice that one too much. I can, that one is just a scale. to the, I'm getting to the loudest part too soon.
Yeah, see, that sounds totally different, right? And, and remember, this is Shazam, right? We've got, oh, I meant to bring him in here, but I'm going to be wearing a hat, a, a wizard's hat and cloak, right? Because it's Shazam. And, um, and so I, I, I want it to have these kind of colorful, explosive sounds, right? Because that's what we're, we're conjuring something and we're imagining, you know, maybe it's a cauldron and there's things bubbling out of it, different lights and sort of things like that. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I want the audience to sort of be able to, if I'm conjuring those things up for myself, then they'll have their own interpretation that is whatever the movie in their head that plays uh, that goes with Shazam, right? And I'm sort of nudging them towards medieval wizard stuff like Merlin or whatever because it's a Halloween show, right? So. girlfriend's calling me in the middle of the stream. I told her that I'd probably be on stream when she called later. Sorry, Helen. Um, so that, that's, I, I, did, I said I wasn't going to practice that lick, but it ended up that I really needed to because I didn't have a good sense of, now this is the problem. I could imagine what I wanted it to sound like, right? I had no problem saying, ah, you know, I'm doing that wrong right away. But I needed to build in what it feels like to make that sound efficiently. Right? A lot of times we have this problem in, in trumpet playing especially that we, we know, we've played a high C before, right? I've, I played a high C, uh, my first one, and it was really hard, but I got it. Okay, great. And the next time we go to play that high C, well, guess what? Our only experience with that note is that it was really hard to do, right? It felt a certain way, my lip tightness, my air, whatever. So. I do all those things again because it got me the result I wanted and guess what? It usually works again, right? Maybe not right away, but I figure out a way and you know, I have now I have two data points. I say, okay, great. High C feels really tight and difficult. Okay, well if I keep doing that that way, it's never gonna get easier. It's always gonna feel that way. And so then I develop a relationship between certain techniques or certain notes or whatever and a feeling, right? And that's normal. That's a human experience thing, right? We, it's how you feel hot and cold and um, how you feel hungry and, you know, whatever, right? It's, we're used to building relationships between, we're really good at seeing patterns. That's why you see faces in, in automobiles and things like that. Um, because we're really, we, we're used to seeing patterns of things and seeing, seeing how things work, right? It's, it's also sort of evolutionary. We want to make sure that we, if the, you know, the, uh, tiger comes into town and some of my friends aren't around anymore, I want to make sure that when the tiger comes to town again, I am not around to be, to, to, to find out why, right? <laughs> and so, um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of wrong answers in some of that. And there's a lot of, uh, um, superstition as well. But anyway, I digress. Uh, when I play the trumpet though, I, uh, in, in large part, we build these feelings because they, represent, this is a totally foreign object, right? This is not, uh, we're not born knowing how to do this. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite, right? We're just not built for, the, we try to build the instruments as well as we can towards what might work for a human body, but we're certainly not genetically predisposed to uh, playing any particular instruments, right? They're, they're artificial. And so we have to build a language in order to interact with them. And in some ways, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of on a tirade here, but uh, I, I'm still within my three minutes. Um, the, the, this is, it's, it's important to be able to build some sort of language to communicate with like the, the success, me, me and this instrument and our success together, right? I have to build some kind of language there. 
And so I do that through, again, a great many trials. But that doesn't mean that I have to just leave those connections built forever, right? A lot of our problems as, we, as you get older uh, and, and more experienced on your instrument, a lot of our problems that we keep with us that whole time stem from how we started, how our, like our middle school band or our high school band, stuff that we, we just kind of had to do it that way to, to get it to work, right? Uh, like a tight high C that just doesn't, almost doesn't want to come out and it's really sharp, right? And so then for my whole life, am I going to let that be the way I play high C? Well, of course not, right? But a lot of people do. And it may, a, a, a tight, a difficult tight high C um, is a good example because a lot of people, that's like high C and D is where their range stops. And they're like, yep, yeah, can't get any better than that, you know? And they don't accept it necessarily, but they do struggle to get past it. And so, and it's because we're, we're using, we're trying to be too uh, feeling based about how that has to work instead of trying to find a better way for it to work that doesn't feel familiar, right? So our familiarity, what we're doing here is I, I didn't have a feeling familiarity at all with this, this sort of color and sound that, that I wanted to get in this passage. And so I had to build that, but I didn't have to settle for the first version that was successful. I then, I tried to keep making that sound the, the correct sound, but feel maybe a little bit easier to do. Or, and um, this is another point of contention, like what is easier, right? What does that mean? Well, it means whatever it means to you. If it's not, um, it's, it, means, it means less effortful, but that could just be putting more stuff on autopilot, right? And that's why we're doing it over and over. So, okay, that was, that was five minutes. But I, I, I did write down and I told you guys, I need to rest more. Um, specifically, I want to rest about twice as much as I play. So that was about twice as much. All right, now we're going to get into the bad lick. This is going to take us quite a few. And we're going to start with deliberate practice. And the TV is, you know, I'm ignoring it right now. Oops. See, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about what I'm going to say next, and I'm distracting myself. So this is why. You don't want to put this on the TV practice, because I'm not even ready to play this lick yet. And I have notes in here, too, that are helping me. I just am not using them. I'm combining strategies, right? I'm doing TV practice when I look up at you, but I'm not at tempo yet, right? I don't have to get to tempo. I have to make this more automatic, and then I can speed it up because I'm not thinking about the notes anymore, right? So it's actually a good, it's a good uh, intermediary between the finished product and what uh, and, and learning it as well because it's getting some of the stuff out of the way. It's essentially, whatever you're, whenever you're doing TV practice, you are offloading uh, some part of what you're trying to accomplish into habit world, into just, that's, how, that's just, I don't, I don't really know how to do it that way, right? You gotta be careful about what you offload in that way because if it's something that you wanna change later, like I am ingraining a slower speed for this, right? So I have to, I have to make sure that I don't just leave it there and then try to speed it up later and not, I won't be able to, right? Because I can only play at this speed. But I am, I am practicing this deliberately enough at first, and then I'm saying, okay, well, I, I can't speed this up with the dynamics and the correct fingerings yet, so let me just ingrain this over and over again, right?
That was also three minutes. Oops, I just broke my timer. Almost, almost got it. I can, I can barely, these timers are so cheap, but uh, as long as the battery stays in, yeah, it works. Um, yeah, I, now it's very, now it's very dim, but it's still working. Yeah, it's still working. So, okay, uh, th that time I used DB Practice to speed it up because as long as it's going pretty well, then I can try to do it a little faster. And uh, now I'm cheating a little bit because uh, you, you are not a TV, and so I am not distracted in any way, but uh, that's part of this as well. I don't need a TV to practice this way, right? I don't need to be distracted. It, that is a, bo a bonus for when I use the TV, but it is not the only way to do it. I need this repetition no matter what. And as a matter of fact, in this piece, I really do need to concentrate first and then try to put them on autopilot. So let's get a few more of them done. Um, I know there are a few of you watching. Please ask questions because uh, I cannot be um, uh, entertaining in a vacuum uh, and, and help you. Uh, although I'm glad if you're just watching and you're sort of doing some dishes or something, I'm always glad to to, to be here with you doing it and doing what I need to do as well. Um, but I would love to answer questions is basically what I'm saying. Uh, I would also love to drink some water I forgot was here. This is my super old fl hydro flask. I've had this for, I think maybe, maybe as many as 13 years or something, 10 at least. I got it because I was testing water bottles for my friend Claire uh, who's a horn player, and she wanted a water bottle that she could keep in her purse that wouldn't leak all over her purse uh, when she was walking around that she could also pick up and use with one hand, like, because, you know, you've got a horn to keep, you know, somewhere, uh, and just grab out of the bag and, and sort of uh, and with, with, a, with a straw. And so I found Hydro Flask to be literally the only one that uh, I bought probably five water bottles at the time, um, I don't remember if it needed to be a certain material. I, I know I bought a bunch of glass ones um, because they all had sippy tops. They all had the, the, the straw built in, but all of them leaked. And so they're still, I think, in my house that I lived in in Syracuse. I just left them under the sink because they're just glass bottles. I mean, I, somebody might find a use for them, but I don't really have one. Um, so I, I ended up with the Hydro Flask and I bought myself one to test. And then uh, I can't remember if she bought her own or if I bought it or whatever, but um, that my research was, uh, I think, her birthday present that year. And so that she had one that worked and uh, and then I kept mine. I have the 40 ounce. I, I replaced it because I left this one at Interlock in one year and um, and it stayed there for two years because of the pandemic. And so I went up and rescued it this past year and I'm happy to I, I'm so glad I have it back. OK, well, enough for human interest. Uh, story time. Uh, let's go with the next the next lick. So we, we didn't finish that lick, right? But we're leaving it for later. I've got plenty of licks. There's so many that I really need to work on. There's one in particular coming up soon. So uh, let me get to there. And I might do TV practice uh, a little bit faster. So let me show you. I'm not going to... These are all a little bit easier licks. And um, so I can work on a few of them in one session. And just, you know, they're not going to take as many repetitions, basically. So we'll start with where we left off. fingerings there. Thank uh... 
was only two minutes, I started to get a little third finger sluggishness that was affecting my other fingers because I was focused on it too much. <sighs> Time to stop. But we did some work on that, and we're right on the lick. We just the next one is the really nasty one that it, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna practice it probably every day until the 31st when the recital is because it's just not. I don't know what it is about it. I remember practicing it the first time I was learning it, and I just never really. I never got it to actually. I never finished it. It didn't seem to matter how much I practiced it. It just never got there. And a lot of times that's because of an ear mistake, but and which did happen with this lick. But in other times, it's just, I, I just, there's not enough time to finish the project for me, right? It's, it's my, it's maybe somebody else could do it the first time and it's not even a problem for them. But for me, uh, there's something about the way it sounds and the way the fingerings work and just my own, you know, inability to do it. So uh, th I've talked about this many times. Does that mean I shouldn't play Shazam? Well, maybe on some level, yeah. If I can't play the whole piece, then maybe I shouldn't attempt it, right? Um, maybe I should keep working on it until I can. Uh, that's that's a totally fair. Uh, that, that applies a lot of times to, let's say there's a piece with a whole bunch of high Fs in it, right? Um, and you can't play a high F. Well, then, yeah, then maybe you shouldn't play that piece because it's not going to sound very good, right? But... If you, if you can play high F most of the time, and then you, and you don't know if you can do it the whole time, but you're you're sure that you can do it some of the time, and uh, and you really like the piece and you really want to perform it and you think that the performance will still be good despite maybe you might miss a few of them, then uh, I think it's okay to try that, right? I think it's uh, you might be surprised, you might surprise yourself. Uh, you you certainly it, you, your job is to deliver a good performance. And so that doesn't mean a perfectly accurate performance. So I think there's a there's a moral sort of ethical issue here that is worth talking about in in these uh, moments that I'm not playing, which is just to say that um, is it okay to play a piece that you know you can't play perfectly? And I think the answer is yeah, it's okay to do that. It's just you have to measure the amount of not good it's going to be against how good the overall performance can still be, right? That's the, that's the, the, the weights on the scale. So if you, if you can play the, well, for instance, um, a lot of people play unaccompanied music on a C trumpet instead of a B flat. And uh, I almost always, if it doesn't say C trumpet, I play it on a B flat trumpet. Why? Well, because, you know, in, in modern 12 tone, equal tempered, you know, music world, uh, it doesn't really matter if it's a G concert or a G for me, as long as the relative pitches together are correct, right? We don't really hear that as, as being all that different anymore. It would matter a lot 100 years ago, and uh, but I couldn't have played it 100 years ago. We didn't have these, right? So, so um, almost, we're almost, oh, well, actually, no, that's not true. Now, I can't say 100 years ago anymore. Sh shoot, 150 years ago, uh, no, 200 years ago, there we go. Uh, we did have these, th th this one, we had this. This is exactly 100 years ago, almost, right? So I, I always forget what date what date it is. It's it's 2021. Um, I'm not. It's not 1984 when I was born. So anyway. Uh, okay. So uh, so yes, I think you should you should be able to play pieces that you you can attempt reasonably, right? Um, but if you really can't play, like let's say you you can't double tongue and you really want to play the Carnival of Venice. And there's a lot of double tonguing in this particular variation for you. And so you decide you're going to slow it way, way, way down and just single tongue it. Well, that's not really an ethical decision to make, right? I don't think that you can, I don't think you can get away with that, in other words. But if you can single tongue fast enough to not need a double tongue and not slow it down, what's the difference, right? Uh, even if it was supposed to double tongue, even if it says in the piece to double tongue and you just can't do it, uh, you know, our double tongue is supposed to be even enough to not be noticeable, right? So... Anyway, that's how I think about it. There's some stuff in this piece that I, I probably really can't do, but I'm still going to play the heck out of it as best I can. And um, and there's also a certain responsibility the composer has to make things reasonable to play, right? Um, in the same way that, for instance, uh, it you know a, a, an ensemble conductor, for instance, uh, has a, an ethical responsibility to to put music in front of their ensemble that that ensemble has a reasonable chance of playing well, right? Uh, if you, you know, if you put short ride in a fast machine in front of a middle school orchestra, 
uh, that's probably not going to work out well, right? So, um, and it's that same relationship is what I'm saying, right? If, uh, if I'm choosing the music for me to play, then I have to have that same, I have to have that same ethical um, decision-making moment where I'm like, well, is it reasonable for me to play this? And the composer does the same thing. Is it reasonable for someone to try to play this? And what do I expect it to sound like, right? And if they, uh, if they write good music, and I think this is well-written, uh, Shazam is, if they write good music, then um, it only elevates my, my personal journey to playing very difficult things, right? I would never have tried to do stuff like this if it didn't exist, because I wouldn't have thought of it, right? So that, that's a cool, that's, that's sort of the positive spin on, on the ethics of it. It's like, yeah, this, this might not have been possible a hundred years ago for somebody, but we we're overall, we're working on more and better things. So anyway, all right, it's time to play again. It's been six minutes. Sorry about that. I, I do love my philosophy of, uh, of, of work. So, um, we're going to go slow this time. sticking. This is another thing where um, what, will, what, what, what will distract you mentally is the PV in this case, right? And that's a good thing, but you don't want physical distractions if possible. And a valve sticking is absolutely one of the worst because now not only is it non-functional, but you, you, you're relying on this motor memory, right? This muscle memory to, to drive everything and so when it breaks down, quite literally, it doesn't work. Is that right? I did it, yeah. Technically, I'm supposed to tongue that A flat. I'll try. I'll try. So this is an interesting one. Um, I actually would like to, before I talk, I need to get something done. So this is my new Tennessee red uh, cedar round. Tennessee rounds, we're calling these. Uh, they are just a delight. So anyway, um, I got that to 80 is what I just learned. Now, here's the bad news. Uh, it's supposed to be 132. So uh, we can do some. And that was mostly deliberate practice. But as soon as I got it kind of in the, in the right shape, I started to do it. So this is how fast it's supposed to go. Let's see. That's right. See, I can't even say it. Uh, so I wrote down 80 because I may need to play it at 80 just to get it to sound good. And again, I just I just got done saying, well, is it okay to slow something down like so that I can do it? in the context of the piece. Well, maybe not for the Carnival of Venice, 
um, because it's a straight ahead, you know, uh, somebody has to play the accompaniment to it and, and uh, it, 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 a variation, a theme and variations, generally you play the same speed almost it, it, with, with slight variation that depends on the style that you're going for, right? Um, in this case, this is all swaths of color and, and shapes and things. I would love to get the exact right notes instead of just, right? I don't, I would love to get the right notes. So I'm going to try to work from 80 up as fast as I can. And then maybe what I decide, if I can get to 110, then maybe I play the whole piece at 110. It's only this small section, right? That goes uh, 132. And, um, and I haven't been putting a metronome on any of this yet, right? I just want to get it really well ingrained. And then as I speed it up, that, that muscle memory will serve me well. So, um, still no questions, huh? All right. Well, I won't go on another tirade, but uh, we might use some, some metronome practice in here as well. Um, and I need to also just play through larger sections of it and see how it goes. So, uh, and that takes concentration. That's not TV practice as well. Uh, so let's talk while we're here, let's talk about some dangers of TV practice uh, that we can avoid, right? Uh, one thing that we've been doing for the last hour is basically uh, resting about twice as much as we play. And that is important if I want to keep going. If I don't want to keep going, in other words, if I want to be, quote unquote, the most efficient with my time, I want to just, bam, get it done. Uh, I, I might do exactly the same amount of rest as playing, right? Uh, three minutes on and three minutes off, like we talked about. But I can only do that for a certain amount of time before I'm going to be tired still, right? If you, if you do any regular interval at some larger number of time, it doesn't really count as half the time resting anymore, right? So in, in other words, I, I take the, if you think about it this way, take the smallest amount of time that you might, you might ever think of doing a timer for, like three seconds or six seconds, right? Uh, I haven't really gone over timer use at those intervals on this stream, so maybe I'll do that next time. That'd be a great, actually, that, that would be really great to do with this piece, and I will probably be ready to do it by then. So, uh, yeah, so look forward to that next week. I'll do some small interval timer stuff. That'll be fun. But um, is it really resting if I do six seconds at a time playing and then rest for six seconds? Well, yeah, no, not really, right? Because if I'm going to play every three seconds or every six seconds, for an hour, I played for an hour, right? So when you think about it that way, there's a logical amount. It, it doesn't have to be a known entity. You'll find out if you journal well, right? But you you have to realize that if you, no matter what the interval is, up to about 10 minutes, um, the rest doesn't count as rest on the large scale, right? You still, in other words, you still get tired and you still should stop at some point, right? There is no interval where you don't get tired ever uh, unless you rest a lot more than you play, right? Then you do feel an in, indefatigable, right? Uh, great, uh, great vocabulary word, indefatigable. You feel invincible. And so you can just go and go and go because every time you play, you're fresh ish. You know, you still, there is still a time limit always, but uh, uh, for, for instance, right now I'm resting well, about twice as much. And uh, that's because I want each of these to go well. If I was also watching TV during all of this, then I would be kind of checking out mentally in the in the breaks. And then when I came back, I would also be fresh mentally. Instead, I'm talking to you guys. Um, oh, we've got um, uh, JD Landisfy. That could be a lot of people that I know. Um, uh, but uh, you're asking, what timer app do I use? And I don't use an app. Uh, I use an actual physical timer. This is... Uh, this one says AF on the top, which is funny to me. Uh, it's timer AF. Get it? And uh, if you don't get it, you're probably just too old. And I am too, but I don't care. So, uh, uh, th but this is also called the tell timer, T-E-L timer, or it's also called the talking timer. It actually, the lady talks to you. There's a, I'll show it to you a little bit. Um, so right now it's timing up for me. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. It's got five minutes-ish. They're, they're really super cheapo things, right? Uh, they were, they were used to be made by Radio Shack and then they sold that patent to somebody else and they used to use them a lot for paintball. Uh, but anyway, so there's this little bottom panel here. This is the voice on or off. So you can see if you turn it on, the lady talks to you on, let's say, uh, 
Oh, she's not talking. Oh, the, no, that's the repeat. Sorry, that's the repeat. The voice on and off is this. And when you when you add seconds and minutes and things to the count down or whatever, she talks to you. Uh, I don't like it, so I keep I keep her silent. Um, and then the sound, you can change the sound of some of the timers. It's got like a train whistle and some other stuff, so that's what that button is. But the repeat, this is what's really important, because on this timer, the countdown, uh, I'll clear it, the countdown timer just beeps and starts over again if it's under one minute. And then over one minute, it, it like goes off on a, as an alarm sort of indefinitely, but it does already like immediately start itself over again on the same interval. So I'll show you what I mean. Uh, I'll do a countdown timer for, oh boy, it really hates me because I, I messed it up earlier. It's getting really weak. I probably need to replace the battery um, again. But, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll make sure you can see it. It's on six seconds right there, right? You can see that. And where's the start button? Okay. Uh, when I start it, right, it starts counting down. Four, three, two, and it's going to go beep, beep. There it is. And it's already counting down the next time interval, and it's going to do it again. So that's really useful for hands off, right? You can just play as hard as you can until you hear it beep. It's a pretty soft beep, but you can also just keep it in your view uh, or, or like put it on your lapel if you, if you think it'll stay. Um, and, uh, and, and then, yeah, you're, you're, you're basically just autopilot at that point. You're, you're really concentrating while you're playing, and then you're just not allowed to do anything um, you can still, like I said before, you can do fingerings, uh, you can sing, but you just can't play uh, the whole time. And at an interval as small as six seconds, you're basically concentrating the whole time, but you're really concentrating. It's a really good concentration builder. Uh, if you do up to about 30 seconds, then it feels just like normal practice, but you're being a little safer than normal. Up to about, uh, if you go up to a minute, then it, it's a really re very safe version of that. Um, but you'd probably do want to do something with your downtime. Uh, in, interestingly, I found up about three to three to six minutes, right around in there, uh, I try not to do anything with my free time uh, in between, right? I walk away from the trumpet. I try not to be concentrating that because it, it's just too much. You get fatigued instantly. And you're, you feel obligated to play when the timer is on. I discovered, so I used to use, um, to answer your question a little more uh, inf uh, uh, broadly, this is the timer I use at home. The timer I used to use was the Seconds Pro timer. And um, it's very interesting, actually. That So somebody wrote an article in ITG Journal uh, maybe uh, almost, I don't know, five or ten years ago now about using the Seconds Pro app for practice. And uh, certainly, um, you know, we've, we've known about using timers for practice for a long time, but they wrote this really nice article about how they use Seconds Pro. And um, I remember thinking, dang it, because I had been using Seconds Pro for years when I saw that article, and maybe they had as well. Um, but I had actually been a beta tester and, a, and helped the developer with some of the early versions of that app. Uh, it was built as an HIIT timer. And I told him, I emailed him and said, I would like to be a beta tester. I use this for trumpet practice. And for a long time, the uh, app store's de uh, description of the of the seconds app, um, which I think it was just called seconds back then, was uh, it said you know uh, this is for this use and this use and some people even use it to practice trumpet and I was like hey that's me I do I do that uh, and I used to have a lot of like email conversations with the guy because I I had sort of special um, needs in development there right I would say well this this uh, sound that you have is not in tune with a tuner, and so it's really kind of grating when you're using it to practice. And he'd say, oh, okay, well, you know, I, I can't really do anything about that because I source these sounds or whatever. So uh, it's a great app. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't do count up. Uh, well, that's not true. It does do that, but you have to build the timers beforehand. You can't just start using it. For that, I use the Time Timer, which is a company that makes like wall clocks and stuff that have like the big red countdown timer, like a nuclear explosion is going to happen or, or nuclear launch, right? Uh, I don't have my phone on there, I'd show you. But, uh, but basically, yeah, it's, it's a big giant red dial on a normal analog clock and you just adjust it so that it counts, it count, uh, this to you, it'll, you know, this it's like three minutes, it'll count down, it'll, this, this chunk right here will be red and then it'll just count down to a fully white clock face 
and it'll set off a timer. I just used it in lessons the other day. That one you have to reset every time though, so that's good for bigger intervals, uh, and it doesn't do seconds. So, um, but if you if you don't have a timer app or whatever, there's uh, there's the Metro timer. That, that that one's free, and it has a metronome that goes the whole time. That's pretty useful. Um, there's uh, like I said, the time timer. Uh, there's Seconds Pro, which I think you have to pay for, but there's there might be a free version of that as well. Um, and uh, oh gosh, there's a lot of them on the on the App Store. You want one that's a uh, sometimes they're called a cyclic timer, right? They, in other words, it self cycles. It goes back to the beginning every time it goes off and just automatically starts again. Um, that's the best thing you, you can get. Uh, so you don't have to touch it all the time and just be like, okay, now let me let me reset this for five minutes and then, okay, now a five minute rest, right? That's, that's what you're trying to avoid. And you wanna just stay on the task at hand uh, for a lot of that. So anyway, all right. Um, that was a lot, thank you for that question. Uh, Hopefully that answered your question. Um, yeah, the talking timer. I don't know if I have some. Let's see. No, I can't find them if they do. I used to have four more backups because I they are only about 11 bucks on Amazon. And they, they come from different companies. And it's a little bit hard to track down like one that works. So I bought one maybe five years ago. And I was like, yes, this is what I want. And then I immediately went back to Amazon and bought like five more and just had them in boxes in my house. And I think I'm down to three now. I have one in the other room, I have one here, and I think there's supposed to be one at school, but I think this is the school one, so I'm not sure, I might be down to two now. They, they break rather frequently, they're not very well made, um, unfortunately. But anyway, that was 12 minutes of rest. Thank you for that gift. Uh, so now, we're gonna go back to it. Uh, we got a couple more licks in this section. And then I'll play through some of it so you can hear it. And then we'll probably quit for the day and I got to make some dinner. So I'll call my girlfriend back. Don't forget. That's, that was me telling me. You, don't you call my girlfriend. That would be weird. Um... slow version, right? Oh, I didn't turn this on. Shoot. I, okay, that's, I see what I'm doing. I need to mark. That's what I got this out for. I mark so many beats in this piece because I really want to be accurate. Uh, I, there's no, it's, it's easy to just kind of play in the space, so to speak. And I think that's totally allowed for what this piece is and how it's written. And, but, uh, for these metered places where he puts three, four, 132 beats per minute. And you know, there are beats. I don't want to, I don't want to extend anything just arbitrarily because I didn't practice it. Right. That's not, a, that's not fair to folk and Robbie, uh, the composer. Uh, so I need, I, I have to do my due diligence and then will say that whatever's left over that I didn't quite get to uh, is, we'll see if that is an ethical amount to leave out, right? So in other words, if I, if I mess up during the recital, it's not like I didn't address it, it's just it didn't stick hard enough. And so I, I'll do better the next time, right? I would think that the composer would want his piece played very close to accurate. And then if I played with the time a little too much in some spaces, like, and well, and to, let's be honest, most, composers don't, uh, they don't necessarily detect like a, a half a beat too much here in a piece like this, right? They just want to hear the colors and the shapes and the sounds that they made. And so it's important to keep that in mind as well. You don't want to be too conservative about this stuff. But I, I do want to work hard to do the, my best version of the right rhythms, right? So I'm taking extra time off, haha. <laughs> that I'm doing a lot 
is I'm immediately going softer instead of doing the actual taper and getting soft by the note that is at the end of it. Um, it's just because I'm, I'm, I'm on overload. So I need to offload some of the stuff. sounding is it yeah right and that's our first directional note so that's three more minutes and my lip is getting tired uh, so we're not gonna quit but I'm going to rest a little more, and then I want to play through what the, the first page and a quarter, like basically the first full page, this whole section that we've just done. And uh, I might just play through the next section to see how it goes. I might There's a couple of things I need to work out, like pedal C and double pedal C, uh, that I can't really play double pedal C. Again, that's, a, that's another like ethical, do I play it if I can't play double, double pedal C? Uh, yeah, uh, I can't even really hear that low, so... I can make a low sound and I can make it change pitch in the right set of intervals, but I don't know that I can do it accurately. I don't know that a lot of people can hear. I'm oh, sure two octaves lower than a trumpet low C is like a no normal trombone note or something. Um, but me playing it on trumpet, it's just gonna sound like kind of fart noises uh, for now, right? I'm, I'm working on my pedal range. I've been working on it since the last time I played this piece and it's getting better. My, my pedal C's are much better. Uh, well, we'll see, I guess, won't we? Oh, we got another question. Thank you so much. What would you do to break it down if you were hitting partials in the middle on those larger intervals? So, oh yeah, so these minor nines, right. Um, what would I do to break it down? That's a very good question. Um, so, I, I think understanding what's happening is important uh, sometimes, and sometimes just discovery is more important. So, if I didn't know how it works, and I didn't have anybody I could ask, then I would simply do what, I, what, what we all always do, which is to say, I want this sound, and I'm gonna try, I'm, gonna, I'm willing to try anything to try to get closer to that. So how would I break down that specific thing? I would immediately try to figure out where I can be successful with the thing I want. So you were saying if I'm hitting partials in between, right? Uh, these, these, uh, these intervals up here I'll play. All right, especially that one. That's the minor nine that he's talking about. Um, uh, I, uh, or, I mean, it could be any, there's tons of super large intervals coming up in the, the slower section uh, that's, that's coming up next. So how would, I, how would I do that? Well, if I'm going, if I'm getting sort of basically a glissando there, right? Well, then there's a couple of things happening. One, uh, well, like I said, if I had somebody to ask, I'd ask them, like, what's going on here? And I'd say, oh, well, okay, you have to sort of build your oral cavity almost like a trap, right? So that I've got tons of air going through on the lower note, and my, but I'm also holding so that it's not a higher note than that, right? So in other words, I'm gonna lower my tongue, I'm gonna blow harder so that when I release that uh, lowered tongue back into a normal tongue position, it springs onto the note I want. So that's how you would clean up a normal slur, like, You're basically uh, overdrive with the air, under uh, um, lowering the tongue positions, and then and, and then holding so that it stays a low G, and then you're snapping, you're snap releasing everything else, including the aperture, but you're keeping the air the same, and so you get this really clean slur, right? So I, you practice that by just thinking about bouncing off the lower note. That's the typical pedagogy, uh, but I like to know about those those parts, right? And if a, if an octave is too much then, okay, then you might do other intervals, right? Like, uh, uh, but like I said, if I don't have anybody to ask, what am I going to do? Well, I'm just going to decide what, what reasonable goal I have 
right? So I, for in your case, right, you're saying, what if we're hitting partials in the middle? So we call that like maybe a dirty slur, or a glissando, kind of glissy, um, portamento is another word we use, right? Uh, then I'm, I'm gonna say, well, I don't want that. I want a clean slur. I want just these two notes and no other notes, right? Okay, so I could try that. That's always a good place to start is, well, maybe I, maybe I can just clean it up. Maybe I, I don't know how to do it, but maybe if I just have that as a goal and I try, Nope, didn't work. I still get the I still get like a C or an E or something in there. Okay, well then that's not uh, me just doing that a lot. Uh, might not might not make it right. I I will still do it a lot. I still want to just try it for a while and see what I see what I see right. See what I can figure out. Uh, maybe it works sometimes and then I can go. Ooh, well what was that? All right. So that's if I just bang my head against the wall. Uh, eventually I'll learn something hopefully and that, that will benefit me and then I can start to go that direction. But I think a much, a much better method, uh, for me at least, is to, is to simplify the problem. And I, I had a math teacher that said not to use the word simplify because it doesn't mean uh, the same thing to everybody. But in this case I'm using it deliberately because it's whatever is simple to you. Uh, and so I, I want to basically choose something that I know that I have a better chance of doing right now that is in some way similar to the thing that I'm trying to accomplish, right? So I want this minor nine to be a clean slur, but it's not. And just me trying to clean it up on my, just, just by just force of will also didn't work. So now I need to think, well, what is going to work? What can I try that I think I will be able to do right away, right? So, I, and I can be wrong, this is the best part. I can guess wrong. So I would break it down in, in this way. Um, I would say, all right, well, what if, what if I just make it a little easier? I'll go from, instead of G to A flat, I'll go from G to E flat, all right? It's still a cross partial slur with a fingering. I can even do the same fingering if I want. Well, I'm still not getting it. And of course, I'm doing this deliberately, right? I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm play acting someone who can't clean this up, right? Because I was getting it pretty clean before, I think. Um, and so, okay, so that didn't work. Well, all right, what, now what do I do? Well, I could simplify it further, right? I could find, let me find where the breaking point is. Let's, how about that, right? Well, of course it's not there. Of course it's not there either. Can I just do that? Is, is that, you know, can I do that without a, a, a sort of glissy, you know? If I can do, then I'm already off to a good start. So I've found some place so far that is, it's going in the right direction and it's successful, right? That's what we want. Then I'm gonna keep stepping it up. I'm, I'm just gonna keep asking for a little bit more, right? That one's really hard for me, actually. I get a little piece of the B flat every time. So I could build this all the way up. And, and eventually get, and I, I don't know what I'm doing, right? I just know that the thing that I've been doing keeps working, keeps working, keeps working. And when it breaks down, okay, I go one back, right? Let's say I couldn't do uh, the F, right? And the, just the up, upward one is really bad, let's say. Okay, so great. going to do the E until I feel really confident that it's never going to, it's not, it's always going to be really clean. And then one of the times, almost by accident, I'm just going to put down my, my first finger and it's going to be an F, right? I'm going to hear that. So that's a way to do it. Um, that's a whole set of like, okay, I had to, I had to back it way off of what it really is and just get something that's some, that has some kernel of the same thing in it, right? So it was, in this case, upward slurs starting on G, and I had to find the boundary, the limit, where I physically don't know the coordination to do it well, and then I had to work at that boundary 
before I could start pushing it further. And that might take months, depending on what it is. Uh, in this case, this probably wouldn't take months necessarily, but it might take it may take months or even years to make it really super duper clean if that's really what my concern is, right? And I can't do it yet. Um, so that's, I'm just pushing that boundary up further and further. And I'm gonna, that's gonna be a day-to-day -day project, not a right now project. That's one way to address this. Another totally different, maybe not different, <laughs> but another totally different perspective, let's say a different, a paradigm, uh, uh, a, a pirate gentleman difference is, uh, is what, we, what we like to say in my family, um, is to say, okay, right, what, what is it about this that's so hard for me? If, if I'm having trouble cleaning something up, then it, the way that I'm getting from one note to the other is maybe it's easy, but it's just not clean. So um, I need to change that, right? And that might be because it takes too much. Maybe there's too much changing to get to, from the G to the A flat, right? If my air is changing, well, I, that's, uh, that's too slow. It's going to get a bunch of junk in it. If my lips are doing a big shift uh, in the, in, in, uh, like closer together, let's say, then maybe I'm going to get all the notes that are on the way there. Uh, maybe maybe it's the, the problem is that my air is doing all of the work. In other words, that I'm, getting, I'm just pushing the air through and to get the A flat, and that's why I'm getting every single little thing on the way. And I'm gonna to have to find a different way. Like I was talking about the mechanism of the tongue position motion is what cleans this up, right? So I have to discover that. How am I going to discover that uh, is a totally different question. But I, again, I can reverse engineer it from what I can do well already. So let's say that the A flat is no problem, right? We're, we're, it's a different problem entirely to just simply not have the range to do something. And, uh, but let's say I, I can play well, let's start there, actually. Can I play an A flat in any, from any approach at all that doesn't stress me out, that's not like, oh, I'm hanging on for dear life, right? And I think I can. So once I can get it, it doesn't matter if I can just pick it off. I don't have to do that, right? But if I can just get it some way and make sure that that is the way I want to play trumpet, actually, Okay, great. Well, now, now can I go? Can I get one of the directions clean? Because this is where it gets really interesting. And I could build it the same way. I could go. Well, what what interval downward can I get clean first instead of upward? Right? Maybe that doesn't work. Maybe instead I get the A flat and I go downward and then I go. Oh, okay. And now I'll just do that backwards, right, for the upward one. So. a yip in my downward slur here because I'm really supporting well and blowing hard into the trumpet. Uh, you can clean the yip out uh, of downward slurs um, and I wish I could remember exactly what it is that that makes that happen but that rippy kind of sound that you get um, is really uh, it's more efficient physically to let it be in there and so you have to, to clean that up you have to do a lot more work I think. Let's see I don't think I can do it. It's, it's basically kind of your, your, your lip getting dragged along. It's, it's the sound of it being un, uh, uh, all of those things that you're skipping over, trying to respond, but it, you're going so quickly to them that they just have like kind of a bright yip sound, I think, right? That's just a guess. I don't know. But I, I sort of cleaned it out, but I did it by a, a sort of adjusting the air very slightly so that I wasn't blowing as hard. I was blowing just right. And I'm not a just right kind of guy. I want to just, I want to blast away as much as I can so that there's at least one element that's not changing too, too often, right? Uh, if I get the shape and the sound, I, I don't want to blow literally as hard as possible or anything, but I just don't want to be massaging that kind of like, well, just enough air. And then I'll, you know, because then I'm, I'm more likely to miss notes that way. And I'm, I'm okay with the yippy sound. I think it, it fits here. So anyway, I, does that answer your question? Please tell me if it doesn't, I would be, 
Uh, happy to, to be more specific if you have a more specific question. Um, in general, I would just do more octave slurs. And like if, if I wanted to just clean it up over time, then I would work more on lip slurs, right? That's, this is a lip slur even with valves, right? Every, there's a great old saying that you can slur something without tonguing it, but you can't tongue something without slurring it. And that is to say that, yeah, if your air is always having to do the slurred version, and then your tongue is maybe just cleaning it up or making an articulation or whatever, right? So, so yeah, I would do more, more basic slurs and more advanced slurs as well. So uh, a great place to go is uh, octave drills from the Schlossberg book. Most people don't go past the warm-ups, uh, which is the, the first section, right? And there's a lot of really great stuff in there that also will help with this. Um, but yeah, for specifically stuff like this, uh, minor sevenths and minor ninths, uh, octave drills, being really great at the octave, then you're just putting down a fingering or something and, um, and you're doing what you're used to, right? So that's a different approach. Anyway, thank you for that question. Uh, that was 15 minutes of sort of mostly explanation. So I'm gonna reset it and pretend that that was not mostly playing. And, uh, and we'll go back and please ask more questions though. I'd be happy, I'll stay on here as long as people are interested in asking and there's more of you than there have been uh, any time during the stream. So now would be a great time to ask questions uh, because there are more people to ask them, right? So, um, and quite frankly, I still need to practice so I'd be happy to keep doing it. Right. All right. Let's play uh, the piece up until now and see how well it goes. I'm also pretty fatigued after two hours now. So um, I haven't played the whole time. Right. But it's still like I said before, TV practice over time uh, has a toll. Even if you are resting half or more of the time, I'm still going to every every trial is still a trial. Right. All right. Here we go. Oh, I'm supposed to check position and foothold as if preparing a complicated trick. So I have to think about what I want to do. I used to do this like this, where I would like grab my, 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 <laughs> this part of my leg, right? Uh, and like, and just check to make sure, like I was, I thought about it as like an acrobatics trick, like, and I would dress up like I was working out. And um, in this case, I'm not doing that. I'm dressing up as a wizard. And so I have to check, uh, it says position and foothold. So I guess position being like where I am in the room and just kind of like make sure that I'm in the right spot, right? Um, that's one, uh, again, this is a great thing. Tell me what you think check position and foothold means. But uh, uh, so yeah, and then foothold like that I'm ready for anything, right? That I'm like, okay, I'm ready to go. And so that I think looks basically the same as the acrobatic version of this. Um, so I'll check my positioning like that, right? And just make sure that I'm ready to go. And this I'll have my trumpet in my hand with my wizard cloak, right? And, and then I'll be ready to go, right? I'll have already done this part off stage. This is the first thing on my recital, by the way, so don't miss the 7.30 start time because I'm gonna come out of the gate swinging. All right, so I, I come on stage, I check my positioning, right? Make sure that I'm in the right spot. Uh, I think I'll do this under a blue spotlight, so I might have to have a, a stand light. Um, and then, and then I, I, okay, I'm ready, right? Stand up straight, and then I'll begin.
Whew. And look at the end, so I forgot what note was last. That was okay. I messed up one rhythm real bad, but I got some stuff that we practiced, right? At a much faster tempo, so this is proof that this works. Uh, it says turn page, so I did. All right, well, I'll try to keep going. That was, that was right on the edge. It's the right note. Sorry. Oh, I'm not done. this yet. So that gives you an idea of the middle part of the piece. Now, uh, we are almost at the end, actually. There's only one more page. And I did practice that pretty recently on, um, well, I, I did, a, I put a little, uh, uh, what do you call, sorry, I'm saying ah a lot. TikTok slash Instagram slash Facebook, tiny little video of me wearing the wizard hat, uh, playing like basically the last half a page. So we're only missing uh, about a page of stuff that I have practiced, that, or that I, sorry, that I haven't practiced on the internet, uh, which is maybe more terrifying than uh, I would like to admit. Now, a lot of that stuff did go super well, and that's because I won't, I, I, I won't, I'm not planning to play this after two hours of practice, right? I'm going to save my chops and knock this out of the park as hard as I can. And then the rest of the program will be a lot easier on me. I'm only playing one other legit piece, which is the uh, this, this dialogue for trumpet solo and imaginary friend, right? By Edward S. Solomon. This one is singing and playing, and it's a little bit tricky. I might try to do this on stream next time as well. Uh, what did I say I was going to do on stream next time uh, that I would be ready for? Darn it. I can't remember. I'll watch it. I'll watch it in this next hour, and then I will know. That's what the stream is good for, uh, for me.
So anyway, but I'm only playing this as another legit, actually pre-written trumpet piece. I'm also going to have to transcribe the laughing, the OK laughing record uh, trumpet part. And we're going to perform that with the whole audience. Uh, if you don't know that, look it up on YouTube. There's a really great, very cleaned up um, version of it. Uh, the, the, most of the archived copies are really scratchy um, uh, because it was a wax cylinder, I think, originally, maybe. Um, so anyway, the laughing record, very interesting little cornet piece, I guess. It's more about laughing. And so we're going to do that. And some performance art, and I'm going to I'm going to tell some scary stories, and uh, I'm actually going to use this microphone, I think, and set that up so that it is uh, dynamic enough, and you can hear the nuance in the voice um, when I'm storytelling, and also so you can hear the singing almost as loud as the trumpet playing. If I use this roughly the same setup, then it should sound good for the stream and sound good for the audience, and so that's the idea. But yeah, so if I can just get through this piece uh, once. That's all I need. And then this piece will be pretty easy. The OK Laughing record, I get to stop whenever I want as long as I start laughing. So that's pretty good. And um, I think that might be all the trumpet playing on this recital. This is enough, right? It's just six and a half minutes of hell. And, uh, then, and then the rest of it's a lot sillier. So, but I think that will be good. Uh, audiences, I think, are... I'm, I'm all about the audience is doing whatever they want, but I think in return, we get to do whatever we want to them, so to speak, right? So I think it will be really uh, educational for an uh, audience here in Greenville, North Carolina to experience some performance art and have to think about that, right? And not everyone will like it, but uh, there's nothing too terribly uh, um, challenging on this program. There's a piece called Laughing, and there's a piece called Number 403. I actually, I'll show you. I got this for that piece. This is a, a, a lovely little alarm clock that I'm going to use. And uh, I have to pick my pencil very carefully. But, uh, and some other things too. It's, it's supposed to be mostly spooky, uh, but I wanted it to be light and entertaining as well. And so I, I have to choose my stories. And so I think that's what I'm going to go do now is read some more scary stories out of the famous uh, scary stories to tell in the book. Uh, <laughs> Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark books. Uh, there are three volumes, and I'm on the second volume. Uh, right now, I've picked about five that are candidates, and so but I just, I'm going to read all three of them. They take, it takes about an hour to read every story in one of the books and, um, and think about it and like decide if I want to tell that. So um, anyway, that's going to be the recital. Again, it's on the, uh, the 31st, which is only nine days away. Is that possible? Yeah. It's next weekend, sen uh, Sunday, I think. I think. Yeah, that's nine days. Anyway, I hope to see you there. I'll do one more of these, I think, on Friday. And um, until then, I, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope I answered your question. Thank you so much for asking questions. And uh, I look forward to seeing everybody next time.